everyone, uh, a very warm welcome to this uh, second session of day five of this uh, winter school uh, in uh, under Dr. Yathar Sachar, Assistant Professor at Manipal Center for European Study. In this session, we are going to discuss another very, very important issues uh, that is EU's strategic partnerships and its connectivity strategy, specifically uh, Global Gateway in relation to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, now, as we all know that over the past decade, uh, uh, especially in the background of China's uh, phenomenal economic and military growth, the world's focus has uh, turned to Asia, especially the Indo-Pacific. Much of this focus has been dominated by infrastructural connectivity needs. The idea that regional dominance will be won via infrastructural connectivity has been gaining ground since the announcement of China's uh, BRI initiative back in 2013. Several initiatives have been introduced to offset that one particular initiative. Now, Asian economies like Japan and India, they have sought to build alternatives to BRI. Although the US, uh, it launched its Pivot to Asia initiative back in 2011 with infrastructure in mind, it took United States almost eight years to launch the infrastructure-focused Blue Dot Network with Japan and Australia. The newly resurrected Quad has upped their efforts with its recently launched new infrastructure partnership. Quad partners have already financed uh, billions, uh, worth billion dollars of regional infrastructure since 2015. In December 2021, the EU officially launched its Global Gateway strategy to build resilient connections across the world. Under this strategy, the EU will mobilize over 300 billion uh, euros in investments between 2021 to 2027 in both hard and soft infrastructure across digital, climate, energy, transport, health, education, and research sectors idea is to create an enabling environment and guarantee a level playing field to all. Now to discuss some of these uh, developments much more in detail uh, and EU strategic partnership in the region, today we have with us Dr. Michael Retterer. Dr. Retterer is a distinguished professor at the Center for Security, Diplomacy and Strategy of the Brussels School of Governance and the editor of CSDS Policy Brief Series. In September 2020, he retired from the European Diplomatic Service as ambassador uh, to the Republic of Korea. His previous posts also include ambassador to Switzerland, deputy head of mission uh, at the EU delegation to Japan, among many others. He also co-chaired the Joint Group of Trade and Environment Exports at the OECD, served as a panelist at the WTO Dispute Settlement, and was a member of the European Economic and Social Committee. For his distinguished service in 2019, Dr. Retterer received Order of Merit in Silver with Star from the Government of the Republic of Austria. And in 2020, he received Honorary Citizenship of Seoul from Seoul Metropolitan Government, Republic of Korea. A very warm welcome, uh, Dr. Retterer. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. This is my first trip to this part of <laughs> India. Uh, but unfortunately, as many of these trips, um, I keep sitting in my private office in, in Vienna. Uh, so nevertheless, I, I hope that uh, in the not so distant future, we can change to a real meeting. And it would be um, the first uh, uh, to add a first to my travel experience. Well, as, 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 as you have heard, um, um, I have I, I spent uh, 40 years in diplomacy in the Austrian diplomatic service and in the European diplomatic service. And I can say I spent the larger part of my whole career somehow connected uh, to Asia, either serving in Asia, in uh, Japan uh, two times and in, 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 in Korea, or working as uh, ASEM counselor. Uh, for four years and at the time organizing the European side in that uh, process. And that's, by the way, also the, was the occasion when I met Levi, who is uh, an expert on, on ASEM, and we have done uh, quite some work together. 
Now, what, uh, what you have asked me to, to, to talk about is a little bit about partnerships, strategic partnerships, and, 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 and how uh, the European Union um, is uh, working in, in that region. Um, well, I have made a sort of plan, and I'm not sure how closely I will stick to the plan, but um, I, I think uh, uh, what we are uh, discussing is, is the EU becoming a global player? Because if you are want to be present in, in, in the uh, in the in Asia, in the Asia Pacific, and then in the Indo Pacific, well, you have to step beyond the near abroad of the European Union. Now you have to take up global challenges, um, and uh, this is discussed in the European uh, context under the heading of uh, strategic autonomy, <clears throat> uh, or sometimes there's also talk about sovereignty. Um, I am not a fan, and I will explain uh, why, uh, of strategic autonomy. I prefer to talk about strategic responsibility. Um, uh, the context to all that is what we like to call the liberal international order, um, which is the concept developed basically after the Second World War, and which served us well but served us well. And again, I would uh, propose a slight change to move from a liberal to an inclusive international order, and then I will explain uh, why. Um, I also think that this movement, which uh, uh, is also the title of the talk, from connectivity to global gateway, from Asia to the Indo-Pacific, this is a sort of wake-up call uh, also for Asia, because connectivity was connectivity with Asia. Then we moved from Asia to the larger concept of the Indo-Pacific, and now with, 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 uh, uh, with global gateway to the globe. So the advantage which Asia had in having a connectivity uh, program from 2018 has to be used we, we should profit from before it becomes more dispersed on a global scale. But we will see, in, I think the global scale will be very much concentrated on the African um, uh, continent. So that's, 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 that, that's the, global, the global gateway. Well, then a few words about financing, because this is sometimes, I must say, one of the shortcomings of the European Union. Uh, European Union is great in developing papers, concepts, um, but then you have to implement them. And if you implement them, well, if you don't have a little bit of cash at hand, it's always a little bit difficult. So that's uh, that's approximately what I what I want to, want to do. But I also want to to, to start out with this uh, list. You you just can can look at it uh, uh, because it shows that the uh, European Union, contrary to what I read sometimes, is not a newcomer, a newcomer to, to Asia or to the, to the Asia Pacific or to the Indo-Pacific. Indo um, uh, that would also belittle my own work in the last uh, 10, 10 years or 15 years where I was pushing very much also to add the strategic uh, dimension to the EU relationship with, with with Asia, and uh, I have just listed a few policy paper and a few relationships which show that uh, the European Union can actually build on uh, a basis, and that it is not necessary to re to reinvent to reinvent uh, uh, the, the wheel. I think what is what is in, in interesting right right now is that. While the pandemic brought all the restrictions to which I was already refer referring to, which uh, turned sometimes in isolation and boosted nationalism, we are talking right now about this enlargement. So are we out of step or are we for once smart and acting proactively? So I think this is something uh, to, to discuss. Um, the, idea of the European Union is to become more um, a global player. Well, again, not surprising, 
Um, the EU has a strong position and it's one of the major uh, traders uh, in, 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 in the global trading system, investment. It's the largest inv investor in many Asian, Asian countries. It's the biggest spend of official development aid, of, of humanitarian aid. It is working hard with rules and standard setting and that has been called the Brussels effect in order to influence global governance. And um, if you put all that together, uh, then uh, you can ask yourself, well, why the hell is that not a leading uh, power? Um, there I must also say, um, normally the introductions of speeches is quite different whether you listen to an American colleague or a European colleague. Americans would normally start up start out and say how great they are they are number one here number one there and 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 and, and you will get the impression wow everything is, is is perfect very often the european discourse is 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 more well we are doing this but we could do it better and 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 and, and well we are doing something here but however so I think this is something which, which we should also overcome in, in, in the discourse, not to, to make ourselves bigger than we are, but all these many number ones here, I think they should be the incentive uh, and make sure that the, the, on the way uh, to becoming a more active global player, there is something uh, to build on and we don't have to invent uh, the, the wheel uh, again and, and, and again. I think what is necessary from the European Union is to move from soft power to smart power, but also adding a more traditional security dimension. And this implies not only learning a process for the European Union, but is also a development requiring a change of mindset. And this is, um, uh, this is when strategic autonomy comes, uh, comes in. Uh, another ed addition of this discussion is the debate about the strategic compass. I don't know if you have heard about strategic compass. Sometimes in the European Union, we come up with very interesting terms and people are wondering what they are talking about. But if you, what do you think, what is a compass? Well, a compass is a means which helps to find your direction, to put it simply. And which direction is the European Union looking for? Well, it's looking do, where to go in terms of strategy, where to go in terms of threat perception. I mean, if you, uh, if you imagine for a moment um, the situation in Europe and the geographic situation, then you will understand that right now, while we are talking, that our friends in Poland, in the Baltic states, uh, in Hungary, they are especially concerned what Russia is doing or not doing in and around Georgia. The, this is neighboring country. But even from Vienna, where I'm sitting right now, I could, I could drive within five hours by car to Kiev. So I'm not talking about something which is far away. If I am sitting, however, in Portugal or in Spain, well, then suddenly the Ukraine and Russia is much further away. And now the difficult task within the European Union is to develop a strategic thinking and a strategic culture which unites all member states, irrespective of their geographic situation and also irrespective of, 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 of their history. So Spain and Portugal still have a tendency to look a little bit to Latin America. Well, that's good. This adds a dimension. Uh, however, uh, the threat perception in and around uh, Europe is, is, is quite, uh, quite uh, a, a different one. And this is something which we, which we have uh, to, to work on. So the European Union has to take up these this, this global uh, uh, challenges. And uh, there, uh, like everybody else, uh, we are noticing the, ri the rise of China and the increasing assertiveness, which goes beyond the Belt and Road Initiative. 
uh, I don't have to dwell uh, too, too much on, on, on concrete examples, but Hong Kong and Taiwan are synonyms to which a growing nuclear arsenal and the modernization of the People's Liberation Army's Army, the claims to the South China Sea and the fortification of artificial islands are just a few examples. And in terms of India, you always have border problems uh, in, up, up in the north. <clears throat> so I think this is a sort of systemic challenge, uh, which becomes more pronounced. Uh, you know that the European Union has come up with a sort of, of, of trilogue, uh, what the, how the relationship with China is. China can be a, a partner, uh, can be a competitor in economic terms, or it can be a systemic rival. And I think here in that area, we see the systemic rival having a systemic challenge, which is becoming more pronounced. These aspects also determine the US position and intensify the strategic Sino-American competition. Avoiding choosing sides or hedging has become part of diplomacy worldwide, but especially in the Indo-Pacific. And as a consequence, Alliances are actually weakened as they are no longer seen as, uh, as, as um, all encompassing, but they become more sectoral. And that is, in, at, at the end, um, a weakening of, 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 of alliances. Then we also see that one of the, what, I, what is often referred to as Asian paradox, good economic relations but bad political relations is coming uh, to an end because keeping these two things separate because of geoeconomics and geopolitics is, is, is fading away, which adds a, a new uh, dimension. So the, uh, with, especially with the Indo-Pacific strategy and with the global gateway, I think the European Union is taking up this, uh, this, this, this global uh, challenge and is not withdrawing to Europe. Also, the problems in the near abroad, uh, in the Ukraine, as you have mentioned, but also if you think in terms of North Africa or, or if you, if you uh, think about the Middle East, is still very, very uh, pronounced. Um, the U.S. also, I think, is, is, is posing there a challenge for the, for the European uh, Union because what I would call pivot uh, point two to the Indo-Pacific, uh, following pivot point one of the Obama in, 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 in administration, has a consequence uh, uh, because uh, it, the U.S. is withdrawing from other regions or is paying less attention to other regions. Well, the rather catastrophic exodus from Afghanistan was a visible sign of U.S. retreat, re retreat from, from an area. But we can also expect that the U.S. is spending less attention uh, to North Africa and the Middle East and uh, expects allies the European Union and or NATO, I think, to step in in a sort of burden sharing uh, function, but that has all uh, to be uh, worked, worked out. Well, um, that's also to a certain extent, not only a challenge, but also a chance uh, for, for the European uh, Union, because what we, what we have learned again, not because of COVID, but it was a sort of, of, of catalyst, uh, that uh, we have to have a critical look, an analytical look on uh, supply and value chains. So for example, from the strategic uh, and security point of view. Now the challenge is that that should not need to deglobalization, but to adaptations and ideally to more and not less cooperation, but with a different goal and sometimes with different uh, tools. Such a cooperation is, of course, uh, particularly important for the health sector, uh, but, but, uh, but it is not uh, um, limited to it. 
And it also has uh, uh, to be spelled out clearly because we should not fall into this COVID or pandemic mindset that everybody is retreating uh, and, and that we uh, get into more isolation. And th that's always in political terms accompanied by nationalism, which we would like to, to uh, uh, avoid. That would also um, uh, you know, just sharpen and deepen the cleavages which we see in societies. And if I say so societies, I mean national societies, but I also mean the international um, uh, uh, society. Uh, you can look there at, again to the United States. We have we had the tragic anniversary of January 6 recently, but you can also see it in in, in Europe, where the, the 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 consensus around values is is weakening, and this is also something which has to be has has to be uh, um, taken taken care of. So the. Um, but Global Gateway and the Indo-Pacific, they are not just policy papers for the outside world, that's the main purpose, but they always have also an internal effect on the European Union, which is, which is important, and we call it Team Europe approach. Well, what does Team Europe approach mean? Well, it means that the European institutions and if you have studied a little bit the EU, then you see there's, uh, there's the Commission, there is the External Action Service, there is the Council, there is the Parliament, and there are the European financial institutions. So just making sure that these institutions are working together and they are working hand in hand with the member states, that's a challenge. And policy papers like the like the two uh, I have mentioned, which have to be adopted by by consensus, they also have a unifying effect on on the on the European um, uh, Union. That's important also for for our partners to know that behind these policy papers is consensus. So it's not one of the institutions. Uh, going wild, but it is uh, a, has a unifying uh, uh, factor. Um, what um, the European Union uh, also is clearly indicating in 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 in, in these papers that um, it also is aware that a certain military dimension is 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 necessary. Uh, I think that's also a, uh, significant in the context of of Asia because military engagement and hardware have always been an important yardstick in, in Asia, which has made, has made the European Union look less relevant in security issues. Still today, um, of course, uh, uh, the size of, of armies, the size of navies, the size of the air force, the missiles um, uh, play, play an important role. But what the European Union is adding to this to this element is the comprehensive security, which I would call comprehensive security with European character characteristics. It's much wider in scope, uh, covering effective multilateralism, rule of law, and it is human and value based. Despite this different focus, which is important to acknowledge, this does not mean that security or the military dimension are planned out. On the contrary, all these elements are part of the concept of comprehensive security, and you find in the Indo-Pacific strategy for the first time also a clear reference that the European Union, the member states will make an effort to coordinate uh, also their, the activities of their navies and how to organize uh, port calls and also show the uh, uh, interest and engagement. This is quite a new uh, uh, development to which the strategic uh, compass should make a contribution. Now, from now, let me say a, a few words about uh, this concept I have said at the beginning. Um, it is significant that right now, while the European Union is coming out with all these these, these papers and is working on the strategic compass. Also, NATO is working uh, on a new uh, strategy. NATO 2030 
is a discussion process which should lead this year at the NATO summit in Madrid uh, to, a, to a new um, um, security concept where the discussion is on what role will China, for example, play in the security concept of NATO, a new dimension. That was at least uh, the plan. Uh, I hope that the, the troubles with, uh, uh, with Russia will not become a major ob obstacle and dominate uh, too, too much, um, because that should become a forward-looking uh, paper uh, for, for, for NATO. And also in that respect, I think uh, strategic responsibility would be a better term to use by the European Union. When the discussion started about uh, the European Union taking more of, of uh, a more active role, um, their strategic autonomy uh, was very often used in the, also uh, and questioned in the context of NATO. What, what do you mean? Do you want to be a second NATO? Uh, do you want to dominate uh, the, the, the NATO? Um, uh, and this was this, this autonomy uh, uh, concept. I mean, autonomy basically means that the European Union uh, should be in a position to act alone if necessary, uh, but the concept would always be to work and act together with partners and, and, and NATO uh, is the security partner and includes, uh, of course, the uh, United uh, States. So working with the United States, there, there is important also in relation to the, to the Indo-Pacific. Indo so um, I have published with a, with a colleague, uh, Ramon, a, a policy brief, uh, which, which was mentioned, uh, I think in April of, of last year, where we were ed educate, ed advocating at the very early stage that uh, there should be a closer cooperation between the European Union and the United States when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. So it was, it, it was at the end of the day, I must say, <laughs> our pleasure to see that on December 3rd, um, uh, this meeting took, took place in, in, in Washington on the level of, 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 of deputy uh, ministers. And uh, I think uh, it is significant that this first of all happened, and secondly, that the common principles were uh, confirmed. Let me just uh, quote from, from the press release. The two, the two deputy ministers, reviewed their respective Indo-Pacific engagement and strategies. Both reaffirmed their intention to work together and with partners in support of a free and open Indo-Pacific that is inclusive, based on the rule of law and democratic values and contributes to the stability, security and sustainable development of the region. The United States and the European Union share a strategic interest in strengthening cooperation with partners in the Indo-Pacific on the basis of shared values and interests and in support of a multilateral rules-based framework. Both sides reaffirmed the importance of ASEAN centrality and supporting a strong and independent ASEAN. Well, uh, end, of, end of quote. Well, if you think a little bit about, uh, about that, uh, that uh, joint statement, then you, then you will, will see uh, actually a strong influence of, of the European Union, the, the value-based the, the value approach. Um, the working together in an open uh, manner, which is a sort of code name. I think we should not see everything only in a binary for or against China uh, uh, dimension. Also, the reference to ASEAN and ASEAN centrality is, is, is important um, because there, I, I'm, I'm say, I must always say, uh, personally, I'm, 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 I'm not very happy or pleased, although that doesn't matter, um, with, uh, with the setup of, of Quad and AUKUS. Um, because just let's take Quad, everybody who is participating in, 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 in Quad uh, arrangement is paying lip service to ASEAN centrality. Well, the only <laughs> partners, well, not the only one of the partners missing in Quad is exactly ASEAN. 
um, and the European Union. And the same applies uh, to, to AUKUS. I think this min minilateral uh, corporations are fine if they fulfill a certain purpose and a certain task. However, um, I think they should not uh, be uh, a, so an attempt to be the managers, the directorate of a huge area like, like the Indo-Pacific. Indo so therefore, I was happy, happy to see that. And I think it is also a wake-up call uh, with ASEAN, where the European Union has a long-standing relationship. Um, uh, this year, uh, there will be celebration of 45 uh, years of, 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 of partnership, and um, uh, ASEAN has become the 11th uh, strategic uh, partner of, of, the, of the European Union. So the wake-up call for ASEAN is, well, um, if you want to have somebody who is supporting multilateralism, uh, as does the European Union, then it is the ideal candidate to be admitted to the East Asian Summit and uh, what is called ADM Plus, uh, the meeting of, 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 of ministers. So this is, this is something which is still, still, still missing. Um, and also to show strengths, I think ASEAN will have to make some, uh, some, some progress in keeping its house in order. I know that ASEAN is very reluctant with uh, non -in or with interfering in, in, in domestic affairs, but what's going on in Myanmar uh, is, 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 is not in honor of, of ASEAN. And I think ASEAN also has an interest to finally conclude um, uh, the code of conduct negotiations with, with, um, with, with China on the, on, on, on the South China Sea. Also, it is not entirely in the hands of, 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 of ASEAN, but I think there is also support uh, from, the, from the European side to make sure that the rule of law is upheld. And if you're talking about uh, the South China Sea, we are talking about UNCLOS, uh, and, 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 and this is an important uh, rule of law um, uh, element uh, uh, for, for, the, for, for the European uh, Union. Now the, the, the background to 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 this uh, to these uh, actions is is the what we used to call the liberal international order, which is built on values and institutions. However, and I think this is my argument now, the term liberal leaves states that fear being left behind, or those like China who have not participated in the in the creation of, of, of the order, uh, a little bit suspicious. Well, in the case of, of, of China, it's a little bit ironic because it was exactly the liberal international order, which was the, the framework, the environment, which allowed uh, China to develop. Um, but I think if, 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 if we change and, and talk about the inclusive international uh, order, um, then we give connectivity, a larger ge also geographical uh, uh, ambit, uh, which we see in the transition from Asia to Asia Pacific, also to the to the Indo Indo Pacific. So the whole connectivity uh, idea, um, I think, is part of connecting, obviously, but also. Uh, to, ma to make uh, the relationship mo more open, more inclusive. And I think that that, that could, be, um, uh, could be reflected in, in, in the name. And I think that's also a certain, certain tendency. Just think of, of, of G7, which is trying to get the new uh, license of, uh, of, of life in extending um, um, its, uh, its uh, invitations for countries to join the, the, uh, the meeting. So it's becoming something in between the G7 and, and, and G20, but the inclusiveness uh, and out of uh, out of uh, exclusive circles uh, is certainly um, 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 a, a tendency. So, um, giving this additional uh, dimension, uh, I think is is important um, uh, because inclusiveness is what what we need. Because the very nature of the global problems we are all facing, they cannot be solved uh, um, alone, but it, they need this cooperative um, uh, approach. Um, 
it would also uh, what we also need to build up is um, a better network of diplomacy. That's one of my favorites because I have learned that in my last 40, 40 years that there is a certain tendency in international diplomacy to work a little bit on silos. You have one organization, European Union, ASEAN, the, the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Organization of African Unity, um, they all go into one uh, direction and uh, they set their, their agenda and very and very often these agendas are overlapping. And if you have a regional one or a continental one, a regional one and a sub-regional one, then it is very difficult uh, for uh, officials to motivate their, politi their politicians to go to certain meetings because if they look at the agenda and say, okay, well, didn't we discuss that uh, last month already? Um, so uh, agenda setting, in relation to what you can achieve and what uh, what you are ready to spend on is 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 important. Um, and I see this danger right now, and therefore I'm I'm ex explaining that in in the in the uh, efforts to reinvigorate our economies after COVID nineteen and in the transition to greener economies. So everybody is coming up with, with an initiative. So just let me give you the example of the G7, where the US came up with Build Back Better World initiative to, and I quote, help meet the tremendous infrastructure need to collectively catalyze hundreds of billions of dollars of infrastructure investment for low and middle class income countries in the coming years. Nothing wrong with that, of course. But if you think in, in, in terms of G7, there you have France, Germany, Italy, and also the European Union participating. So they should commit to the Build Back Better World and at the same time uh, put their money into the global gateway. So is it realistic that a lot of money will go into a G7 initiative or then into a glo in, in, into global gateway on the European uh, uh, level. And that's not limited to the European Union. Uh, another like-minded partner like, like Japan is running its own partnership for quality infrastructure, which originally was had $110 billion uh, for financing the construction of road, railways, ports, um, uh, of part of its free and open uh, in, uh, in the Pacific uh, uh, program. The same goes for G20 principles, which uh, was organized by Japan in Osaka at, 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 at the time for quality infrastructure investment. So again, if, 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 if there are too many promises in too many international fora, at the end of the day, you find yourself counting how much of the many promises was actually implemented. So uh, this, is a, this is an area uh, where I think we need better, co better coordination because all the projects which are still born at, at birth, uh, they are uh, not good uh, for the credibility of whoever makes, uh, makes uh, the pledge. Now, what we uh, also have to, uh, to have in mind and, and, and in, in our discussion is that given this, the rise of China and the assertiveness in political uh, terms, uh, it also has an in, important dimension, which is reflected in the, in the Belt and Road Initiative, and that is uh, international norm setting. I have uh, said at the beginning, this is an area where the European Union in principle is, is, is strong. Um, therefore, we are talking about the so-called Brussels uh, effect. But the uh, China uh, would also uh, go into this direction and become a norm uh, maker and not just a norm uh, taker. So this discourse power and offering Chinese solutions, and we see that by China 2035 for Made in China initiatives is something uh, to reckon uh, with. 
because it is uh, perhaps um, um, seen um, as too technical, uh, but one big chunk of diplomacy actually is uh, to promote uh, standards, rules and regulations. So if, if, if you manage uh, to play a leading role in setting standards, then you are doing a big service to your economy and to your economic operators because they can operate in a familiar regulatory environment and you save a lot of costs if, for, if, if, you, if you can produce uh, or export uh, according to your own standards with which you are familiar. So this is something which, which, which we also have uh, to have in mind. So therefore acting decisively and effectively uh, would add a positive dimension to this narrative of this inclusive international order. Um, and, and, and it is this field of network diplomacy, I think where we should, uh, where we should uh, uh, work, work on. I have already uh, mentioned that um, this wake up call nature uh, of uh, the global gateway. Um, the um, Asia Connectivity uh, Initiative was specifically designed for, for, for Asia. Um, and um, it was also taken up and there I come to, to, uh, to my baby, back to my baby, to, to Azem. Um, Azem um, took up uh, uh, this connectivity issue and uh, developed a, a definition of connectivity, which is now widely used within, um, within ASEM. Um, and, and, and they are also keeping a sort of, of, of mapping exercise and keeping track what is going on in terms of, of connectivity. So I think this is, this is, this is a chance and, 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 um, uh, and, and we and uh, our Asian partners should not miss, miss that to, to lay the groundwork, because that's also necessary that, that the that, um, um, network diplomacy works. You first work with uh, um, um, a partner, you have a, a bilateral connectivity partnership or a digital uh, partnership, and then you start collect, uh, connecting it within the Asia Pacific, within the Indo Pacific, and then you reach out whenever it's, it's, it, it is opportune and, and, and necessary. So this is something uh, which, which, which is, which is uh, uh, important. And um, uh, it, everybody is aware of it. You can find ministerial declarations, joint ministerial declarations, and that's a typical issue where implementation would make uh, the big, uh, the big uh, difference. Now, uh, a few words to an aspect which I think is not discussed very, very, very often, and that's what I would call complementary cooperation. So what, what, do I, what do I mean uh, uh, by this? The way, it, if you have to implement a project, uh, you have to follow certain rules and regulations. And there we have already learned within the European Union, it is very difficult to make sure that the German, the Finnish, the Portuguese, the Spanish and the Polish uh, administration, to choose uh, a few, uh, are working uh, together because they have a different um, uh, history, a different um, um, uh, way of, of doing this. Now, if you have this problem in the intercontinental dimension between Asia and Europe, it just becomes bigger. So if, if, if you have a connectivity a project or within the context of the Asia Pacific, or you have one on the Indo-Pacific context, context, then you might ruin the chances of um, um, a, a project just because of administrative misunderstandings and the clash of cultures. I'm talking about administrative cultures. So I think one way out uh, could, uh, could, could be to organize cooperation uh, differently, that you define a goal and then you work together, but separately 
in parallel and coordinated. So uh, the, 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 the example is, uh, which, I, which I gave here is one party builds the hospital and the other party builds the education center, not counter for nurses. You know, these two things belong together. But if you keep the organization separately, then you just need a coordinating mechanism, which is trying to make sure that there are synergies. It's uh, that already creates enough uh, uh, problems, but I think it is a good means uh, to assure uh, that uh, international cooperation becomes more effective. So work in parallel, but well organized and get out synergies of what you are doing, but you can avoid uh, working uh, on the same site because that's normally creating um, uh, uh, problems. Well, uh, this is a practical element, but um, I can tell from my experience, this is uh, a problem or, or a challenge which should not be uh, over, overlooked. Now the uh, last uh, element, uh, just briefly on, 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 on the global uh, gateway. Um, I think this, this, uh, all these elements which we have discussed now could feed into this inclusive international order, which should be as comprehensive as possible and it should not turn value free. Also global gateway aims at bringing the EU closer to being seen as a global actor through investment in digital, transport, energy, and trade projects, targets at the good tradition of uh, the Brussels uh, tradition um, and the Brussels uh, at standard setting, which, which I have already uh, um, uh, explained. Uh, it is also uh, uh, good to, to see that this um, approach, uh, the global approach, uh, is in line with what is going on at the United Nations, where leaving nobody behind is very much part of uh, the United Nations uh, uh, development goals, which we should not, um, which we should not uh, forget. Um, this order, this inclusive international order, which, as I said, should not become value free in order to facilitate the cooperation. That would be the wrong the wrong approach, um, but it is this inclusive approach um, should be the mindset, because even good initiatives might not be as effective as they could be if they had this inclusiveness in mind. I'm thinking about this recent uh, summit of democracies. Well, of course, there is nothing wrong with democracy, and we should all work for democracy. However, working to achieve democracy only with democracies, I think that's the wrong approach. So we should there, we should be inclusive, and I think that could be an important part of this inclusive uh, international uh, order. We should. What is also new, I would say, with the, with the Global uh, Gateway is that it has been presented in a more offensive way. Offensive, I don't mean negative here, but active. Um, when you were listening to the President of the European Commission, uh, von der Leyen, in her 2021 State of the Union address, she was saying the following, and I'm just quoting her. We will build global gateway partnerships with countries around the world. We want investment in quality infrastructure, connecting goods, people and services around the world. We will take a values-based approach, offering transparency and good governance to our partners. We want to create links and not dependencies. Well, I think that was a clear a clear message we are uh, we, uh, also to the Chinese approach. And I think she also added to make it very clear, we are good at financing roads, but it does not make sense for Europe 
to build a perfect road between a Chinese owned copper mine and a Chinese owned harbor. We have to get smarter when it comes to these kinds of investments. I think that's uh, also remarkably clear for the, for the European Union and also I think a good, a good way uh, to, uh, to draw the attention uh, that if you are a global player, then you have also to face uh, realities and, and that's the only way also to be uh, effective. So in pursuing its policies based on connectivity, on the connectivity strategy and the global uh, gateway, as well as its Indo-Pacific strategy, the EU should not fall into the trap of seeing everything to the Chinese prism. I have already mentioned that once, and I think these strategies are actually uh, very good hooks to have a larger view and not in this binary uh, way which we see, unfortunately, in the Sino-US uh, um, uh, competition. So offering interested partners a platform and a network of wide-ranging cooperation possibilities is an important contribution to enlarge the room of maneuver for others and opening a path to more autonomy also for them. So that's the hedging element. From that, the EU would profit from this cooperation in gaining strengths and continue to influence global governance. Strategic partners share many of these interests with the European Union and the already broad cooperation which exists has to be organized and reorganized because strategic partnerships for the European Union is something slightly different of, from, from other uh, players. Um, it is not a concept which is used um, very, uh, very often. The EU has 11 partnerships. By the way, when you look at the lit literature, you will see very often 10, uh, because literature has not picked up yet uh, the 11th one, which was ASEAN, um, uh, which was added in, 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 uh, in December 2020. Uh, 2020. Um, a strategic partner must have the possibility to work with the European Union beyond the purely bilateral level, play a regional role or a global role and must be willing um, uh, to engage. And uh, in, the, in, in, in the paper, which I think I, I also put on the, on, the, on, on the reading list, I also made a, a distinction uh, from these strategic partnerships because there are some strategic partnerships of necessity. That's, for example, strategic partnership with, with China. No point in pretending uh, it is not a strategic uh, uh, partner. Uh, however, it might not be a strategic partner of choice. So the distinction is strategic partner of necessity and strategic partner of, of uh, uh, choice. Now, uh, Last element, um, how to feed the animal. I think uh, there I'm, the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, uh, was, was very good in coming up uh, with uh, concrete proposals uh, for money uh, to be spent. Uh, so we are talking right now about the collective effort by the different uh, European institutions, financial institutions, and there is the European uh, Investment Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the European Fund for Sustainable Development. They should also uh, or, uh, be uh, catalysts to get the private sector on board. The private sector, not only in terms of financing, but also in terms of expertise. So if this adds up to 300 billion between 21 and 27, I think it's, uh, uh, it would be uh, enough money in order to get something going, um, uh, especially uh, as, as seed money with the cooperation of, 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 of the private sector. Um, if you put it in relation, uh, China is talking about 1.2, 1.3 trillion uh, dollars for, for, for the same uh, period of time, but it depends uh, very much on counting. But I think it is for the first time that, 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 that we have um, 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 a concrete uh, figure 
uh, and this is gi is giving uh, credibility, I think, to the to the to the efforts. So just let me let me conclude. Um, the EU wants to make it clear that it intends to engage and, where necessary, to compete on 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 the global level. A value-driven foreign policy needs to be need not be ineffective. That's also something which also has to be discussed internally. If an all-in Team Europe approach is taken, adequate means are appropriated to build an inclusive international order in exercising strategic responsibility on a global scale within the limits posed by financial in, uh, resources. So. I think that this is uh, the, 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 the big framework, and within that framework, uh, one has to break down uh, uh, the, um, uh, in, into elements to realize them and then build up uh, a system. So thank you very much for your attention, and I see you, it's about time to finish, to leave some time uh, for discussion. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rachel, for uh, this uh, eloquent lecture and uh, a very informative talk. Uh, we, we now move to question and answer session. Uh, I invite all the Winter School participants uh, to please uh, join us already. One hand is raised. Uh, uh, you can post your question into the chat box or uh, raise a hand, unmute yourself and speak. Uh, yes, Hitesh, uh, you may go ahead. Thank you. Um... Yeah, that. Uh, so, um, and thank you, sir, for your lecture. <laughs> I, I, I was wondering, uh, since we talked about the Open Gateway uh, program, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I should introduce myself. So, yeah, I'm Hitesh, and uh, I'm a master's student doing uh, social and cultural anthropology in KU Leuven. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, since you talked about the Global Gateway program and to, to uh, enhance it, uh, apart from having a mindset that, uh, you know, for example, uh, India and you are already having a common mindset on, on, on that part. Uh, what kind of steps you and uh, Asia uh, relations are creating in specifically in, uh, in, in domain of public diplomacy to curb the gap uh, led by intellectual property rights? Uh, especially in healthcare, uh, technology to understand climate change and, uh, you know, um, like for, for, for small scale, uh, 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 you know, initiatives that people are trying to make in both these uh, economies. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, well, I think the, um, the, mind, the mindset is, is of course uh, something which is uh, difficult to develop because uh, human, human beings are, not, are flexible, but they are not the most flexible bunch. If you look at a nation, uh, then it always takes time. And uh, if you go into sociology, you will see how many generations sometimes it, 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 it takes to, to really change, change the mindset. But I think what, 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 we, what we see in the, in the development uh, right, right now, um, if I compare, uh, the, the global strategy of the European Union, which was uh, formulated in 2016, with the uh, process which will lead to the strategic compass, um, um, the strategic compass is much more inclusive of the member states and not something which was imported after having been developed to, to a large extent by think tanks. So it's a slightly different approach, but in terms of, of, of strategy and to beef up a strategy and security with military means, you have to make sure that you have the member states uh, on, on board. So that's the difference which I see between global strategy and the strategic uh, compass. Now in public diplomacy, uh, the, uh, this has to be sold uh, to, uh, to member states. And member states, in turn, have to sell the message uh, to their populace uh, because it's not obvious uh, to, to everybody uh, that the security between Asia and Europe is intertwined. So this is something which, which, which has to be uh, uh, 
ex ex explained, but uh, the uh, there's a there's a positive spin you can put on on on, on our common enemy or friend uh, COVID, uh, because it is showing to 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 each and every population that it is a global a pandemic uh, element and needs a global um, uh, global um, uh, answers. I think there um, the international scientific community was quite good in developing. Um, um, vaccines uh, in incredibly quickly um, and effectively. And I think at the beginning, the politicians were also saying all the right things. Now, that should be a vaccine which should be for everybody. Uh, nobody will, will, will be cured if not all of us are cured. And there was, uh, there was, there was agreement. But then comes the, the difficult part, the implementation part, to which I have referred to already several times. When the discussion started about intellectual property rights, to open it up and, and, and to let everybody who is able, and it's not, not everybody is able to produce that vaccine because it's, 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 it's technically not, not so easy, then people stepped back and said, well, we, all these arguments which you normally have in intellectual property rights, um, uh, there's a lot of investment, uh, you have to spend a lot of money, and if you spend a lot of money, you have to earn the money back and, and, and so on. And I must say there, unfortunately, um, the, um, the international community has not lived up to its, to its promises and also not lived up to its, uh, to its insight. Um, I must say that uh, I'm, I'm not happy with everybody, but the European Union, again, did uh, much better than, than others because it allowed the export of vaccines all the time. Um, because we, there are also production sites within, within the European Union. But I think what we have to, to do once we have gone through the pandemic is to rethink the international health governance that will be also a process of rethinking uh, the, 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 the World Health Organization. Uh, so this is a big chunk of, of, of work um, uh, and it unfortunately could not be say, solved that problem within, within a year uh, because uh, it's, 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 it's like uh, re rebuilding uh, a ship when you are uh, on the ocean and the storm is blowing well, that's not the moment that you can rebuild your ship. You have to go back to the harbor and then you can do it. Thank you, sir. Uh, we move to our next question. Priya, uh, who is Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rater, for that very interesting presentation. I have two questions that I would like to ask you. One is I would like to know your thoughts on this, this, this existing dichotomy that we see. On the one hand, we have, let's say the president of the European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, saying that in 2019, I think she announced that what she wishes to see is a more geopolitical commission. And on the other hand, you have the EU also saying that we do not want to be part of the superpower rivalry. Do you not see a contradiction in these two? That's the first question. And the second question is on EU ASEAN relations. You just mentioned how the EU ASEAN are celebrating 44 years of their ties, but it, it took, but I don't understand why it took 20 years for the EU to actually upgrade its relations with ASEAN as a strategic partnership. Because the strategic partnership policy itself was, I believe, under, uh, introduced in the early 2000s. And it's almost after 20 years that EU recognizes, upgrades its relations with ASEAN as a strategic partner. Do you not see this as a response or it's closer, you know, clo uh, coming up very close to ASEAN as a response to geopolitical tensions? Yeah, that's my question to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, question, question number one. Um, a geopolitical um, commission and uh, superpower rivalry. Um, well, I think it's it's um, it's not um, um, a contradiction because the understanding and the, the policy of the European Union is what I have mentioned: comprehensive security, which is a, which is a, a larger 
um, concept. And if you if you have um, cooperation, multilateralism um, as your core principles, how to conduct foreign policy, then I think it would be a mistake to fall into the trap of 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 of, of, of siding and say, okay, we are on the American side and we will be uh, um, a part of. Uh, um, the old traditional isolationist policies, which have not worked. I think there, we, the, Europe can, can, can look back on, on, on positive experience, like in the, like in the OECE, the Helsinki process. The Helsinki process was, was born in Europe and has led ultimately to the downfall of the, of, of, of the Soviet Union and has had um, um, uh, an influence on the whole development in, in Eastern uh, Europe. Um, and it was, I would say, this comprehensive soft power approach. Um, I think what the European Union can offer, and that's also in the context of, 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 of Asia, um, there, are, there are enough boots on the grounds or planes in the air and, 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 and boats on the, on, on the oceans. But there are not too many champions of saying, well, diplomacy first, rule of law first, let's, let's talk, let's try to institutionalize talk so that you are not running away if you are, if, if you are frustrated once. I mean, this is, this is one of the beauties of the OECE here in, here, here in Vienna. Uh, despite what's going on in 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 in, 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 uh, in and around the Ukraine, what's going on in Georgia and so on, the representatives meet practically every day in the context of OSCE, and they always have the coverage of of talking to each other without being in in the limelight. So. I think what was meant by, by von der Leyen when she was talking about the geopolitical commission was uh, recognizing that geopolitics is coming back. Uh, one has to adapt the instruments of the, of, of the European Union and therefore the strategic rethinking and strategic compass was, was, was initiated. And we have seen that the European Union in the last four or five years made quite some progress in developing also its, its defense capacity and its, its, its um, 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 uh, military arm, but always in a civil military cooperation. And, and, and I think that's, that, that was a necessary step uh, because otherwise if uh, the, you would not be taken serious as a global player if you want to become one. Now on the second one on, 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 on EU ASEAN, um, well, why, why did it take a long time? Well, it took, it took quite some time um, uh, to get the process uh, running. And I can tell you from personal experience, uh, one of the recurring theme, themes was, was uh, Myanmar. Um, uh, I had all the troubles of the world in, 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 in talking with my ASEAN friends at the time to see whether we should admit Myanmar to ASEM. And there was this issue of, of if ASEAN is enlarging, like seven plus three, and the European Union is enlarging 15 plus plus plus, should there be automaticity uh, if one group enlarges then the other group has, has to accept it or should one look into how the values, common values are, are reflected. So that took some time. And then at the, at the end, ASEAN was not so keen uh, in adding another perhaps complicated partner like the European Union, also ASEAN is quite complicated itself. Um, and, um, we have seen that in efforts to join the East Asia Summit, which happened only once at a uh, guest of, of the chair. Uh, when, the, when, when there was agreement uh, that the um, strategic partnership should be established, it was Indonesia and Malaysia who put in the brakes. 
because they did not like uh, the position of the European Union uh, when it comes uh, to, to, to climate change, environmental protection, and the, and, and, and the rainforests and palm oil. So there, as a diplomat, I, I, I understand uh, Indonesia and Malaysia were taking this as a bargaining chip and said, well, if we want to establish a strategic partnership, we have to come to a, to a conclusion with this palm oil issue, uh, which was a little bit short-sighted, I must say, I must say, because a strategic partnership is much larger than palm oil. Um, um, but it showed uh, that's part of diplomacy. So it was not, I think, the, 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 the European Union um, at the end not being interested. It was this, this difficult uh, process. And I have myself written a few, a few years ago, it is about time for the European Union as a multilateral institution to have a strategic partnership with another institutions, comparable institutions, and not only with, with, with states. So I would say there are some shortcomings on, 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 on both sides, but let's be happy that we have now this, this ASEAN um, uh, partner, partnership, which is actually developing quite, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite nicely. And um, um, I think uh, this, this year there will be the first uh, full summit between the EU and ASEAN uh, COVID permitting so that uh, all the, the, the presidents um, uh, would actually uh, meet uh, for not only in the margins of an ASEAN meeting, but as a standalone uh, meeting, which I think would, would also send a strong signal if the EU and ASEAN can do that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Veronica, please go ahead. Yes, I, uh, Dr. Michael, in responding to your issue uh, that you think is it significant to get to also for EU to engage with non-state actor. This one, I would like to share the opinion with you, uh, the, the experience with you that, yes, I agree with your, with your opinion that it is important for the EU to also to interact with non-state actors because coming to the palm oil issue, actually I did reflect to uh, a form, uh, at that time, Minister of uh, the, uh, uh, Minister taking care of palm oil. That, that is a communication gap. That EU, they actually look for more the environmental, but whereas for the Malaysian government uh, personnel, they see it as a dis discrimination. So they don't look at that. I personally find there is a mindset or communication gap. So I think I agree with you that it is important to look for also non-state actors' uh, interactions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Veronica. Uh, Dr. Rachel, uh, well, I, 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 will, I will just uh, uh, wholeheartedly agree. Um, the, uh, state, talking with non-state actors is very much um, practiced within the European Union. So if, if there's a proposal for rules and regulations, there's, there's normally a big online consultation and everybody can, 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 can speak. The European Union also has the, the Economic and Social Committee where representative, non-state representatives are actually there, but that's internal. Ex, 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 external, uh, I can tell you as a former EU ambassador that we, we have uh, um, strict uh, instruction basically to reach out uh, to non-state actors to work with the, with the, with the civil society um, uh, and, and, and uh, to do that especially in areas like, like climate change and human, human rights that we do a lot. Uh, so that's part of uh, part of, uh, of 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 the job description, I would say, um, that there are discrepancies between civil society and 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 and, and politicians or governments. That's 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 clear. Um, that often happens. Um, then it should be reported, communicated from the EU delegation back to headquarters, and then you have to see how how to play it, because at the end of the day. You have to come to an agreement 
with the government, but you should try to make sure that what you have learned from contact with civil societies is actually taken uh, up also by the government. And if you have a full picture, and if a government does not want to go in a certain direction, and you know from other contexts, this is not entirely in line what people actually want, but then you have to decide, do I want to enter into an agreement, yes or no? Uh, so it's a, a complex um, um, uh, procedure, but uh, for evaluating a position, for evaluating or developing a negotiating position and then in evaluating the outcome of negotiations, civil society views are, are always collected and taken into account. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, while our winter school participants uh, ponder a little more uh, on this topic, I have two questions uh, for you. Uh, I understand that uh, you said in your uh, lecture that we need not see everything from the prism, uh, everything from Chinese uh, prism or this binary between, uh, you know, China and anti China, that kind of binary we should uh, avoid uh, uh, that. Uh, but my question is regarding uh, global gateway. Uh, although uh, I understand that binary should not be there, but as of now, the, this, the whole strategy, it looks uh, competing. Maybe we can move towards the complementary stage and later on. Uh, but right now, uh, when we are at this, I want to know that, uh, you know, uh, how uh, might a global gateway and why also uh, attract countries that are already participating in BRI? Uh, one is that, and secondly, uh, if I have to ask you to just uh, compare and contrast this whole BRI and global gateway when it comes to market access or funding or uh, quality standards or even branding, uh, what is your assessment of that? Well, the, um, the um, I think, um, Avoiding these binary situations, I think, is 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 is, is part of a greater diplomacy, uh, and and I think rightly rightly so. Uh, um, offer, as I put it, uh, countries uh, to open up and have a larger room of maneuver. Um, I think is is essential. Now uh, you can you can do that. Uh, uh, in in explaining your position and also highlighting why the approach, the Chinese approach, the BR, BNR approach is different from the European approach. Um, it's not that all countries are entirely happy if they hear that there are some strings attached, like um, uh, there should be respect uh, for sustain sustainability, for cli uh, climate change, for the, for the environment, and there is also a human rights angle to it. So, uh, some countries will say, no, thank you very much, uh, I'm not interested in your con conditionality. Um, but what countries learn, and that has happened in Europe, for those who have participated in, 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 in BR, BRI and countries in Asia, I'm thinking of Sri Lanka, for example, uh, or countries in, 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 um, in, in Africa, that they found out that they were actually going into this debt trap because of uh, money they got uh, with a grace period. But after five years, they had to pay back a loan very often at more expensive than on, 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 on the market. Uh, and, uh, and when they could not pay, well, they had to seed a port, uh, for example, uh, and, and, and that was quite uh, an infringement on their sovereignty. So there are probably still uh, situations where, where, where countries might prefer uh, to go the Chinese way, okay, if, if they know what they are doing, <laughs> let them do what they want to do. This is, a, this is a sovereign right. But I think from public diplomacy and from explaining, they should know what they are probably asking for or, or getting themselves into, 
and that's the important part and say, well, there's an alternative. And the alternative is if you fulfill this, uh, this, this um, conditions, then you can have a financing either on, on, on a ground basis, rather limited, or you can enter into an agreement with the European uh, Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is one of the highly rated international uh, banks, and they will treat you as a normal uh, partner and will not uh, enter push you into anything because we want to get a political um, uh, uh, end. Uh, because very often when you see Chinese uh, investment is part of a strategy to have a line of the, the, the pearl ring of, of, of harvest um, to make sure that there are that there are um, uh, um, connections between, as uh, uh, President von der Leyen put it, between a coal mine and a harbor. I mean, it's sometimes astonishing when you look in, 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 in Africa that they are rehabil rehabilitating um, uh, um, trains which were built during colonial times. I mean, this is the uh, probably the strongest <laughs> warning uh, you, can, you, you can get. Uh, so you have to offer an al alternative. And I think this finance project uh, now gives the possibility to offer um, 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 an alternative, but the European way is a little bit, okay, leave it or take it. I'm not forcing you to take it if you don't want it. Yes, Leah, please go ahead. Yeah, um, Professor Reiter, since we are on the matter of st strategic partnership, and I know that you've written extensively on the conceptual discussions on strategic partnership, in the sense how EU strategic partnership entails two elements, so there are two dimensions to it. So you have the substantive dimension, and then you have the normative dimension. Now, on if you look at evaluate EU strategic partnership with its with its strategic partners, especially let's let's take the case of Asian partners only. And on the substantive front, it has almost always worked. But when it comes to the normative, you know, the normative dimension, that's where we've had more issues. Uh, it never worked with China to a certain degree. It also didn't work with India. It also never worked with Russia. So do you think that it's now time that the EU needs to re-evaluate the normative dimension embedded in its strategic partnership? Well, I think you are quite right with your analysis uh, in this, uh, in this case, the binary uh, situation. Um, but um, I think when it comes to the, to, to the normative issue, uh, uh, this is an area where we come to some natural limits uh, because um, I, I cannot change your beliefs, I cannot change your ideology, I cannot change uh, a few things, except if I give you such a strong carrot that you are ready to swallow uh, what you actually don't like. It's like a, like a pill, yeah? you know, I think it would, it would be good or I have to swallow it in order to get access to finance, in order uh, to make prog substantive progress. Uh, but if you decide that the pill is, is, is horrible, uh, um, well, then I, we often come to the situation, do I want also to cancel my substantive uh, cooperation? And, 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 and there the answer uh, very often is, well, we have to think about it uh, very, very hard. And, and therefore this distinction between um, uh, strategic partnerships of, of choice and necessity. So I don't like uh, a few things China is doing. I don't like a few things uh, Russia is doing. I, do, I, I don't like a few things India is doing, but uh, what shall I do now? So I said, well, I pretend you are not there. Um, so I have, I, I have to, to adapt. And um, that's of course, then always this uh, very delicate uh, walking on the rope um, how much concessions uh, you are able to make and not ruining your own um, um, policy. 
because when you when you, when you look at the treaty of the european union you have to look at article 1 and you have to look at article 21 for foreign policy and the, the foreign policy basically says well there should not be a foreign policy which is different from domestic policy um, which is rather unique, I must say. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any constitution worldwide where foreign policy is actually framed in such a way that it should, that you should live up to your to 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 your talking. Yeah? So so um, so. Uh, but I think in in, in applying this uh, the, this binary approach, substantive and normative. Well, push normative as far as you can, um, and if you reach your limit. Well, I have to come up with the next decision. Do I want to stop the substantive part? Yes or no? Uh, normally the answer is no, but I, re I reduce the substantive part and I build up an additional carrot. So that's what you're normally trying, um, trying to do, but um, uh, difficult to, 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 to achieve. But I think in the in in, in, in the case of of, of China, um, the 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 approach which was developed with this uh, uh, trilog um, um, competitor uh, partner and systemic rival, I think added one one dimension, and in that respect is 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 more uh, realistic, and and um, um, again you have to to make a choice uh, if a certain issue is part. Is it goes into which box, uh, and 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 very often it's not clear cut. It's a little bit gray zones, but uh, that's uh, a prerogative then of politicians uh, to declare something which is gray to be white or declare it as black. Thank you, sir. Uh, one last question, and then we go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so uh, I, I was uh, wondering how exactly, uh, you know, when um, an ideological government changed within a country, for example, uh, the EU had policies with the uh, Manmohan Singh government and, uh, and since uh, Modi government has come, uh, has, uh, has come into power in, in India, how uh, policies uh, have shifted for, uh, for EU? Like, any specific uh, strategical approach that you have uh, changed? Well, I think it's fair to, fair to say also, I have never worked directly with, with, with India, but India has always been a difficult partner, not, not, not easy. And, and, and um, uh, the European Union has made an effort to, to restart uh, re relationship and I think that was uh, that was now successful. There's there's talk uh, um, um, about working uh, together uh, more 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 closely. Um, there uh, there is talk about uh, a connectivity partnership. There is talk about a digital partnership. There is talk about looking into a free trade agreement, into investment agreement. So issues which were off the agenda. Uh, are now moving back uh, to the to the to the agenda. Um, of course, there is there's also concern on on, on, on human rights in, in, in India. That's uh, that's uh, that's quite clear. That's that that starts from from. Uh, I mean, a government should be should have a secular approach, which means it's it's a government for the whole of India. Uh, that's a, that, that that's an important element. Um, we are we are still looking at the, the the rights and role of women in 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 society. So there are there are issues, but if you have a strategic partnership, that also means that there is a certain maturity, and and if a, a relationship has a certain maturity, it must be possible also to discuss issues where you don't agree, and there is no need to pretend. That everything is is perfect, and I'm pretty sure you know, my Indian colleagues would come up with a long list of grievances what they dislike about the European Union. So that's that's fine, um, uh, but uh, um, one has to address it, and 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 I think there I I, I see now the, uh, an opening on 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 the side of of India 
but also uh, of, of the European Union. And I think already make going to the Indo-Pacific uh, and paying more attention to the South Asia, which was a little bit in the in the in the uh, not in the focus of, of, of the European Union, I think is a is a is a positive development. But what is necessary now is to make sure that it's not limited to the Indian Ocean because it's an important trading route. Yes, um, um, and and securing trading routes is a common endeavor. But we also have to work on the on on, on the relationship with India uh, as as such. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rachel. Uh, participants and uh, dear colleagues, we have uh, come to the end of this session and I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Michael Rachel, who has been so gracious uh, in accepting our invitation and sharing his valuable time and insights with us. Uh, it was a pleasure, sir, to interact with you, to engage with you on uh, such critical issues. Uh, we would love to have you back with us again at Manipal Center for European Studies. Uh, uh, thank you very much.